I'm Jenna Likens. I do university outreach for Red Hat. So what that means is I work with universities to help them do more open source, which is fantastic because we need more students doing open source. Before joining Red Hat, I worked uh, in web stuff doing web strategy for 18 years, mostly with telecommunications and women's reproductive rights organizations. So I thought that I had figured out all the ways that one could really be awful online. And then I joined the open source world. <laughs> I've added some new tricks to my uh, repertoire that I'd like to share with you today. And you guys are all here because you want to know how you can really torque people off online, right? Right? Angry people rule, right? Right. Good. That's what we're here for. So I've created Discon, which is the DEF CON insult scale for conversations. It works just like the DEF CON scale, and it tells you for a given conversation sort of what level of is involved and how you can escalate from one level to the next. So what I'd like to do is go through each of these levels and look at what the signifiers are and how you can take it up from one level to the next. So first off, Disc on level one green, everything is peachy. Blue skies, rainbows, if I were better at GIMP, I would have put a little unicorn horn on the horse. I failed at that. No one is unhappy. This we need to change. For each of these levels, I'm gonna go through a example email and what a response might be, so you can see how these will change. So here we've got one where a potential new contributor has said, on awesome OS version 11, there's a missing dependency on lib plastic cart and lib plastic cart devel, and they've sent a patched. Level one green response, thanks. And I've even told them when it'll land in version 2.3. No one's angry, everyone's pleased. This has got to change. So, I'm gonna take it up to level two, blue. Level two blue is gonna make people uncomfortable, maybe not really hurt. So some examples, and this is where you're gonna insult things, but not people. Some good examples of level two blue are those are really ugly pants, or this is a terrible conference. The commonality here is that these statements are unlikely to really upset people because they're not really personal. So again, let's look at the same email and look at a level two blue response. We don't uh, support awesome OS and we don't intend to. Mediocre OS is fine uh, and isn't hideous like that ill-conceived disaster with plastic cart. So I haven't made it personal. This person is not personally insulted. So that's nice, but I'd still like to take it up a level. How do I do that? Level three, yellow. Easy, add some curse words. Your selection of curse words is up to you. Um, different ones fly better in different cultures. If I had more time, I'd tell you a funny story about my grandmother, but we're short, so I won't. Ask me later. Um, but this is crappy code, or those are some damn ugly pants, might work. Here's an example. Um, substitute your own favorite curse words in here. But basically, I've just unleashed some invective on my poor patch submitter. Level four orange is where things start getting fun. It's where instead of insulting things, or even cursingly insulting things, you actually start insulting people. And some examples of that might be this conference. Instead of saying this conference is terrible, I might say anyone who attends this conference is an idiot. Or whoever wrote that code has the brains of a slug, or that anyone who would wear those pants is stupid. In general, even if people can brush it off, if you say that a program is bad, 
it's a lot harder to brush it off if you say whoever wrote that program is bad or stupid. So here's the same email, but this time you'll notice that I've pointed out that only a fool would update past awesome OS 10 and version 10 is the only one that anyone runs real systems on. So if you're running 11, you know, you're stupid and you don't run real systems. So some nice embedded insults in that one. That's still not good enough though. We want to take it one more, right? Yeah, bring it. So, disk on level red. This is your top level. How do you get there? Threats. Add in some threats. This is the quickest way to make any community feel hostile, unfriendly, and honestly frightening. So some examples of that, you're not just cursing, you're not just insulting people, you are wishing people harm, or you're wishing harm befall them. So for example, anyone who would write code like that should crawl under a rock and die. People who have that little fashion sense would be better off if they were just hit by trucks. And here's my final assault on my poor patch submitter. <laughs> so this person is probably never gonna come back. And here's a little summary of what these different levels are and what they correspond with. We interrupt this program to point out that I clearly don't believe any of this is a good idea. It's a terrible idea. And the good news is that there's a body of research to back me up on this. Research? Yeah, research. There is a field called organizational behavior that was started in roughly 1999 or 2000 that looks at the effect of environment on how productive people are. There's also a good body of work that supports the idea that incivility and aggression are associated with occupational stress, decreased productivity, and reduced job satisfaction. Now I want to be crystal clear about something. I am not saying that conflict is bad or criticism in that is bad. In fact, studies show that conflict and criticism can be good, that they lead to increased group performance on certain kinds of tasks and they help groups avoid groupthink. So conflict is not the same thing as incivility. Not the same thing. You can have a disagreement without it being awful. So the term workplace incivility came into being in about 1999 in this Anderson and Pearson article. There are two things I want to point out about this slide. One is if you take the word workplace and replace it with online community, this is exactly the kind of behavior we're talking about. Characteristically rude and discourteous, displaying a lack of regard for others. The other thing I think it's important to point out about this slide is this word ambiguous intent. This is important because I think that a lot of what happens in our communities that ends up making them feel unfriendly is not intentional. People don't mean to crush others. It just kind of happens. It comes out of people's mouths, so to speak, before it's been well thought out. And that's important because if we recognize that it's not all intentional, then we can be more forgiving and more helpful as people try to correct their behaviors. So what's this research that I'm talking about? First of all, there's a decent sized corpus of research that shows that our communities do, in fact, exhibit the exact kind of behaviors that are considered incivil or aggressive. 
interesting aside, and when I started researching this, I was blown away. Because we do everything in the open, there are a lot of people who are using us for research data. Like lots of us. Um, and they're sociologists and linguists and behavioral scientists. And because all of our data is out there, they're using our data to do the research. So there's all these studies about open source communities and behavior, and I was you know, absolutely flabbergasted to find them. I have a stack four inches tall of research studies about how people behave in open source communities. Okay then, there's some caveats and emptors, and of course, and studies are studies, but let me show you a couple that I found. One study published this January found that on LKML, Linus, on average, gets in salty twice a week. Another study, another study that did, it was actually a uh, automatic sentiment analysis study. So they wrote a piece of software to do sentiment analysis in order to validate that piece of software. They did a human coded sentiment analysis first. And they looked at two mailing lists, the Apache Tomcat and the Apache Ant lists. And they found, they, they categorized the emails in a couple ways. And negative emails made up about 19% of the developer list, and actively aggressive emails made up 1.6% of the developer emails. And that doesn't sound like a lot, you know, 1.6%, so what? But if you think about how many emails come in in a day, and think about how many conversations you have, and that 1.6, that's a lot. And that 19% are negative. I mean, one out of every five emails is negative on the developer lists. That's not a happy place to be. Another study showed that we accept flaming as a way to build status. We think that, you know, showing somebody's wrong in a really argumentative way that requires asbestos pants is a way to show how good you are. So, oh my God, the, what are you wearing? That's awful. Did, did no one tell you that you really can't wear those at all unless you're like in Hawaii? Yeah. That's okay. totally <laughs> out of style. We think when we do this to people that it's just between us and them. It's not. It's between us, them, everyone else who saw the conversation, and everyone else who reads it. A week later, two weeks later, two years later, who's considering joining the community. I, I've been calling that the lobby effect. Somebody's going to watch this video and think, oh my god, I'm a horrible human being. And I'm not. I actually thought that was a kind of a cute shirt, but let's... Um, so remember that we live in the open. It feels like we're having one-on-one -on -one conversations. We're not. We're having very public conversations. So what else did I learn? One study found that all, almost everybody who came to an open source community and then did not come back, did not come back because they either did not receive a response at all, we flat out ignored them, or because they received a condescending response. That's awful. I mean, you know, you, you walk in and someone either just doesn't pay any attention to you at all, or they do the <sighs> RTFM. So, how can you, we've talked a little bit about um, the disk on scale for conversations and the research that backs up that we actually do this and that uh, it is as harmful as it seems like it is. That said, let's go back to how we can make things worse. So what are some things we can do that might make it worse? Easy ones, really easy ones. It's all caps. 
<laughs> shouting its patterns, I'm saying. More punctuation. Because they're not going to charge you extra for it. And, and you know, the difference between what do you think and what do you think is, is huge. If you exaggerate how much impact something is going to have, that'll help for sure. I came up with this phrase, tender words, to describe words that when you put them in an email, kind of tip the balance from an email being even-toned to kind of being jabby. And some of these are from my experience. Some of them are <laughs> from others' observations. Technically, if someone is using the word technically in an email, you can probably just ignore it because they're going poke, poke, poke. just ended up here because it is one of my tender words. I have discovered that when I'm writing emails, if the word just slips in there and I'm not referring to something that just happened, it's because I'm angry and I'm trying to be right rather than have a conversation. If you'll just open the fu and I need to stop, walk away from the keyboard, let it go for a minute and move on. Assumptions. This is an easy way to ramp up the level of unhappy in your community. Assume everybody else is an idiot. No one else knows as much as you, even about their areas of expertise. So if anybody posts anything, make sure to go at them and say, well, what makes you think that's Stoke? I would like to see your facts and justification. Assume everyone is just like you. So, you know, comments about how the wives are going to get mad because everybody's staying late. Because everybody's got wives, of course. Assume that everyone is doing, is at the same life stage. Assume everybody's a white middle-aged guy while you're at it. And that, by the way, is as close as I'm going to get at, to the women in tech talk. And I don't do that talk because that talk deserves an entire talk unto itself and being rude is equal opportunity. A lot of these things make a lot of people, some of whom are women, uncomfortable and make them choose not to be in our communities. That one, the assumptions, is a big part of it. And finally, assume everybody else is out to get you. So forget that you're all on the same project, working towards the same end goals, and instead assume that if someone asks you a question, it's because they want to destroy you. Whenever I get to this point, and historically, we talk about, um, you know, these are the things that happen. You start getting what look to me like excuses. And I want to go through what these excuses are and rebut them a little bit. It's not that bad. It's not that bad, Jen. I mean, this stuff really doesn't happen all that often. No, it's worse. And the, the research shows that it's worse. Furthermore, it's worse when you consider the public face of open source and what people see when they go and they try to find out information about open source. Isn't having rude people around part of diversity too? No. <laughs> um, and 
when I was building this deck, I was working with my husband who's been doing open source development for 16 years and he made a great point. He said, when we are working with code, we would never work with an API that was flaky or poorly documented or caused problems with our code. Why do we accept less with the people we work with? So why do we accept rude people in our communities? They are the flaky, bad, badly documented APIs. So I hate this one. So open source is transparency. And transparency, of course, means saying everything. And if you say everything, you might as well just say it however you want. And somehow that nets out to open source means saying everything however you want to say it. That's crazy. I mean, that just, that just doesn't make any sense of this sort of false logical progression. And you can be transparent without being incivil or rude. Well, you know, the community leader's a jerk. What can I do about it? It is, I admit, hard. If the person who is the community leader is being a, a poopy head, um, they do set the tone. However, one of the things about open source is we believe in the power of the individual as well. We believe you can fork the code. We believe that you can make a change, you can make a difference, and Change never happens unless individuals commit to making change. So one of the reasons I agreed to do this is because you collectively are the power of open source. And if you collectively choose to be differently, then this will change over time. People don't live forever community leaders change. We can behave differently. I can't, it's too hard. I don't know how. Yeah, I'm sorry, if you can write a bash script, you can follow the rules for being polite. Politeness is just syntax and idiom. It is no more than that. And if you can follow good code syntax and idiom, you can follow the rules for being nice. And if you don't know what those are, people can help explain them to you. This doesn't even make sense to me. This, this implies that there's some sort of power in fire and the melding of the and yay. This is this crazy. I mean, there's no research to show that that is true, and there's a lot of research to show that it's not. That in fact, the burnination scars people and drives them away, and we lose good people on account of it. So that's nuts. <laughs> it's just crazy. And then you can't control how people feel. You know, my job is to say the thing, and you're, it's, it's up to you how you take it. To some degree, we are, of course, in control of our own emotions, but communication is a two-way street. You wouldn't expect to write code any old way, shape, or form and hope that the program interprets it correctly. You know, there are rules of the road, and communication is the same way. So follow the rules of the road for good communication, and you will be better off, your community will be better off. And then you get the big old etiquette is stupid. And I gave you Heinlein. Etiquette isn't stupid. Etiquette is what keeps society moving. And finally, if it's important to you, you'll find a way. If it's not important to you, you'll find an excuse. So how do we help? I'm gonna go through these really quickly. If we have a way to talk about bad behavior, we have a way to discuss it, which helps us fix it. Use my scale, use something else, just talk about it. If you see somebody doing something that puts you up at a level three blue, talk about it. 
don't do any of that. That's just a bad idea. If you're writing an email and you've seen you've done it, stop. Walk away from the keyboard. Come back to it later. Know your own tender words. Discovering that just was one of mine, which I will admit took me until I was 41 years old, was a big kind of light bulb. Know what yours are. Know when, when you see yourself type just, that you need to stop, step back, walk away from the keyboard. Avoid making assumptions about others other than trying to remember that you're all on the same team. You're all trying to get to the same place. And if you remember that and try to hear what they're saying through that lens, I just totally mixed that metaphor, then you will be better off. Ask for stronger codes of conduct. Spell out that insulting people is not okay. And that level five red, abusing people, is never okay. And you should be expelled from a community if you do that. Remind people of the lobby effect, that what we do is visible not only to the 15 or 20 or 50 of us in the room, but to everybody who's doing research about our communities or who's considering joining this community in six months. And that because of that, it's, it's not a private space, it's a public space, and we should try to set good examples. If someone is crossing a line, contact them. And I recommend doing it either offline, you know, by phone if you know them, or by email. It's really tempting to do it on list because transparent and because, you know, you want to be right. If you can, go off list especially if it seems that they have done it and they don't realize it. That gives them a chance to back out. And remember what your end game is. Your end game is to get everybody working together. It's not to win an argument. So contact them and say, you know, when, when I read this, this is what I heard. I'm not sure that's what you meant. This is a blank slide because this is where I tell you a sad story. I was lucky, I was incredibly lucky. I came into open source sideways because of good friends, people like Tom Calloway and Ruth Seeley, who I knew who were involved in open source. I went to bar camp at RDU for four years before I ever started working for Red Hat. Therefore, I knew the ideals of open source, the transparency and community and collaboration before I ever really saw a mailing list. And that's a good thing, because if I'd come in through the front door and had gone looking for mailing lists and projects to contribute to, I probably wouldn't be standing here today because I would have seen what happens, especially if I had happened to stumble upon things that talk about women in open source. And I would have said, nope, don't need any of that. I'm perfectly happy doing web stuff, thank you very much. And that's really sad. So every week or two, I go and I stand in front of rooms full of college students and I tell them how magic open source is and how powerful open source is and how open source is the only thing they don't need permission to go do, that they can go join an open source project and start committing. They don't need to take a class, they don't need their parents' permission, they can just go and do it. And the last week I was up at a, a college doing this in Western North Carolina, I'm sitting there talking to these people with this giant pile of research in front of me showing how badly behaved many of our communities were and reading these quotes these things that people actually said to each other and looking at these kids and going, God, can I really send them into this? And, and that, that made me feel bad. Like, can I, can I send them into this and feel good about it? So 
Then I got depressed and was like, oh my God, I can't even do the rest of the deck and what am I gonna do? I can't tell these people anything. This has all been said before, nothing's ever changing and you know, crisis of conscience and, and life is terrible. And then I realized change happens because people continue to tilt at windmills and that we have to keep talking about this. The more we talk about it, especially in places like this, where you are the leaders in your community, where you can make this change happen, the more likely it is to happen. So I finished my talk, wrapped up my slides, did the next talk at a college and, and told the kids how magic open source was and that they could do it and rah, rah, rah. And I look at you and I'll give you one last permission. Let it go in the Elsa sense. We've all made mistakes. Every last one of us has said something not maybe in the most polite way we possibly could have. Our behavior hasn't perhaps been the best reflection of who we want to be. It's okay. I give you permission to today start afresh, to make it better starting today. If everyone in this room said, we can do better, I know we can do better. We can coach our younger people to do better. We can coach our other community people to do better. Our communities would be better. And that's what I want. Thank you. <laughs>